Welcome to this final lecture, week eight, and we'll be looking at our attitudes on dying and death. As we begin this last session, I'd like to rewind to week three when we talked about suffering and dignity and belonging for these topics definitely go together. And so we'll revisit the reading by Henry Nowen, beginning on page 26 of his beautiful book. A good death is a death in solidarity with others. To prepare ourselves for a good death, we must develop or deepen our sense of solidarity. If we live toward death as toward an event that separates us from people, death cannot be other than a sad and sorrowful event. But if we grow in awareness that our mortality, more than anything else, will lead us into solidarity with others, then death can become a celebration of our unity with the human race. Instead of separating us from others, death unites us with others. Instead of being sorrowful, it can be a new rise to joy. Instead of simply ending life, it can begin something new. The mystery of life is that we discover in the human uh, togetherness that what really, where we're powerful and strong, is really when we are vulnerable and weak. And this is what is especially true when we are with our patients in their journey to death. The real question before our own death then is not how can I still accomplish or how much influence can I still exert, but how can I live? so that I continue to be fruitful when I am no longer with my family and friends. That question shifts our attention from doing to being. Our doing brings success, but our being bears fruit. The great paradox of our lives is that we are often concerned about what we do or still can do, but we are most likely to be remembered by who we are. So as we talk about our attitudes and perspectives about uh, dying and death, and keep in mind the beautiful words of Henry Nowen, I'm going to share with you a story when I was newly ordained as a Presbyterian minister, and it's, it's fairly daunting. There's all this new stuff, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm ordained, and what does that mean, and am I worthy? Probably not. And there's just a lot to process in those um, beginning uh, months and years. And then you kind of take on the mantle, and you kind of get used to this um, amazing thing called being ordained. But early on, it's very, very, very intimidating. And I was at a, a ministerial alliance where we met weekly to uh, read the scriptures for the upcoming week and to talk about them and then to prepare our sermons. And there was a well-seasoned pastor. He'd been ordained 15 or 20 years. And I remember clearly him saying, I have been a pastor just long enough to know that I am scared to death of dying. And we were all like, you want to explain that a little bit? And so as he explained it, he has no fear of death itself. For he, for he absolutely believes in the resurrection. He believes in Jesus Christ. He believes that the, at the cross, Jesus overcame the worst evil. He overcame death and that that is our promise and that is our hope. He believes that. He's got that. But as he said, I have been with enough of members of my congregation on their journey to death in the dying that I am scared to death of the dying process. That helped me early in my ministry to reframe fear. And so as I've walked with members of my congregation on their journeys from dying to death, the question that I, I often ask, are you afraid of dying or are you afraid of being dead? And there is a big difference in those two answers. And a lot of people haven't really thought about it quite in that context. And often they will look at me and say, well, I'm actually okay once I'm dead. It's the unknown leading up to that process, when and how and where and what and the suffering, all of that unknown is fearful and scary. But the death itself, oh, I got that. I believe in the resurrection. I know that I will be with Jesus. And so it's really been helpful to me to look at that differential point between dying and death. So are you afraid of dying or are you afraid of what happens after or both? And 
And that's a great, it has been a great tool for me that I wanted to share with you as a way to help talk about um, realistically and um, logically. For when someone has great fear, we are operating out of something that is completely not logic. We are operating out of fear. So that little bit of, well, if you're afraid of one or the other or both, that kind of helps guide the conversation of where we are. And one of the um, points that has given me great courage and encouragement in my journey has been the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism was a, a Q&A thing that used to make the uh, catechism uh, students had to memorize it. Uh, adult or children, it didn't matter. You had to memorize all of these questions, answer one, answer two, answer three, and um, you would be quizzed that you knew the correct answers. And this came um, out of a profession of faith that came soon after the Protestant Reformation. But question number one for me really encapsulates the uh, Catholic and Christian faith traditions together. And here's question number one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer, I believe that in life and in death, I belong body and soul, not to myself, but to my Savior Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his very own blood fully paid for my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. And that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair on my head can be harmed. Indeed, that everything must fit together for his purpose and for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And if you only remember the very first part, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer, that I belong, body and soul, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, For I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will not perish. For everyone who believes in me will truly live. From the Gospel of John. And even on the journey through dying to death, we take great comfort from the words of the Old Testament as the psalmist who says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. It is important to look at where you are and how you anticipate or acknowledge the mortality of each of us. For as we know, from the moment that we have been physically born, we are on a journey that ultimately will end with physical death. We are visitors here. We are not on this earth forever. And for some, that can feel like bad news. It could feel depressing. It could feel negative. It could just flat be a downer. But I have always looked at this small amount of time that we have and the end being physical death, what that does is it reshapes our attitude and our perspective for being present here now. It means that we appreciate those that we are with. We realize that we are not in this same context forever, that our children will not stay young forever, that our parents who are aging will not stay aging forever, and that it helps us to slow down, to rewind, and to fully be present, and not to count it as anything, a negative, the physical body of death, but to look at it as the journey as we make the transition from this life to the next. For it is truly a holy and sacred uh, blessing for a nurse, for a pastor, to walk on this earth and to be present with family and with uh, patients who are in some regards grieving because they're letting go of this life, but help them to anticipate moving into the next life. And in the uh, Presbyterian Church, we call it joining the church triumphant, for we are, have triumphed in our death and we are with our Lord Jesus Christ. And not in a simplistic way at all to not uh, belittle the pain and suffering on the journey, but to know that ultimately our God has suffered 
our God has died, our God has been risen from the dead, and that that is the hope and the future that we must uh, claim and cling to as we walk with our patients in their own journeys. And I want to share with you a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is halfway through the Old Testament. It's 12 chapters. It's not read very often, but I will tell you it's my favorite book in all of Scripture, for it is about the meaning of life. What is it that makes life worthwhile? And the final chapter, tw chapter 12, is about aging. It sounds a little bit like it's in code, but I'd like you to listen to the words from Ecclesiastes, which is timeless wisdom literature, which tells us that through the centuries, people have been wrestling with what is the meaning of life? What does it mean to grow old and ultimately to die? Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble came and the years approach, which when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the moon and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return with the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop and the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim. And when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all the songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and the dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stored, then that person goes on to their eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember them before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered in, at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns in, to the ground from whence it came, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. From ashes we have come to ashes we shall return. It is the cycle. It is the journey of life, and it is to be embraced as sacred and as holy. And as we end our time together, I'd like to share these beautiful words of Scripture and the closing prayer, which would be the final um, word said at a committal for a celebration of life for someone who has, as we've said, gone on to the church triumphant. And this is from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, which we know as Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God. And this beautiful prayer which comes from Hebrews chapter 13. Go in peace. And may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ make you complete in every good so that you may do your Father's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory be forever and ever. Amen.